Welcome, and uh, good to have you with us again. This is the Nick and Jim, or Jim and Nick podcast, um, a little waywards, and uh, good to have you guys with us. Nick, good to have you here. Yeah, it's great to be here, Jim. Good. <laughs> I think the last time uh, we were, there was a little bit of up with Nick. Uh, uh, you mentioned that in the last one. We were uh, some words of affirmation coming your way. Maybe a few more. I've got uh, a couple <laughs> of questions I'd like to, I'd like to ask you uh, in the context of, of the, uh, the conversation. But first off, how, how have things been with you? Uh, things have been generally pretty good. Um, yeah, just try, still trying to get used to the pace of life kind of happening in in uh, this time period. You know, lots of family time, lots of walks. Oh, it's been a beautiful spring. Mm. Um, oh, my gosh, just getting out and walking around Bruno and, you know, walking around Bruno, <laughs> literally around the whole town. <laughs> but uh, it's just been great. How about you, Jim? Um, yeah, much the same. It's, uh, it's nice with the turn of weather. The snow's gone. Uh, every day I've, I'm out for a walk, I see uh, another variety of bird that's around. Mm. So it's nice to see them all coming back. And yeah, spring has sprung. And with it, I find there's always a, a renewal, a springtime of hope as well. Mm-hmm. I find I find for myself that there's often like even spiritual themes kind of coming up when the season changes. Yeah. Um, and speaking about the birds thing, like owls, I've been seeing lots of owls mm. around Bruno. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh! I, it's just something I'm not really that that used to seeing, but like seeing snow white owls and great horn and all the rest. Anyways, enough about that. But yeah, cool. Uh, cool. You should read Farley Mowat. I have. They're here. Owls in the Family. Owls in the family. <laughs> yeah, it's a great book. <laughs> Saskatchewan resident or no? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, it was, I think the book was written uh, about a space, a place in Saskatchewan. Mm-hmm. In any case, um, I realized it. We was, I was chatting with somebody the other day and, and uh, they were mentioning about the podcast. And, and I'm a bit of a known entity, uh, but your more recent arrival uh, here at St. Therese and in yeah. Bruno. And, Fresh off the boat. Yeah, fresh off the <laughs> or boat. Or the green hopper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Pirates on the North Saskatchewan. <laughs> In any case, so um, I, I just thought it might be interesting just to hear a little bit more about what brought you here. Uh, as I was pondering that, I always come back to those words that, uh, that Jesus speaks in the, uh, in the Gospel, of, Gospel of John, uh, the first words that are spoken. Um, uh, you know, what, are you, what are you looking for? What are you seeking? And he turns around. And, and I guess that might be is like, what, what brought you out to Bruno? What brought you to St. Therese? What were you seeking? Hmm. Well, of course, uh, Jim, that's a bit of a loaded question um, because there's, uh, there's more facets to that and odds and ends and bits and pieces that I, that I can probably summarize in 20 minutes. Um, but yeah, just I guess a little bit about, 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 about myself because I don't think I've actually even introduced myself on this podcast yet other than my name's Nick. You know, maybe my last name in there once in a while. Um, I'm born and raised in Eastern Canada from Prince Edward Island, um, you know, home of Anne Green- of Green Gables. And so like any further east, you're going to get wet. Uh, exactly. <laughs> in fact, you have to get wet before you, you hit get. the island. <laughs> you know, it is an island, you know. Um, we've got the longest bridge over freezing waters, you know. It's, mm-hmm. it's a po- moment of pride for the islanders. There's a whole other twist on that song. Like a bridge over freezing waters. Yeah, that's the Canadian version, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I so actually don't know what we're so referring to, but that's song, okay. Probably before my time. Yeah, probably. Um, anyway, so I'm from Prince Edward Island. And um, yeah, like I, I grew up in that area and always lived there. Um, I did my undergraduate degree there. I did my master's degree long distance through Birmingham, England. And um, so I, uh, Saskatchewan is actually the first province I've moved to other than um, Prince Edward Island. And, uh, you know, why did I end up in Saskatchewan? One of the reasons is because I married a Saskatchewan girl, right? And, you know, Saskatchewan girls tend to want to come home. Um, But in terms of actually ending up at St. Therese Institute in Bruno, that's more interesting. Um, Because that's, I think, really the first starting seed of me coming to St. Therese Institute was actually picking up a little book on St. Therese. Mm. Um, about two or three years ago, there was a point in my spiritual life where I realized that if I wasn't going to start diving deeper into my relationship with the Lord, that it was just going, I was going to end up depressed and stressed and um, everything else that kind of comes with that. It kind of like, you know, there's a, I think this is a pretty common point for most disciples of Christ is that they hit this point where they realize they've been doing so well, but 
then there's a point of decision or a crisis, mm -hmm. you know. And mm -hmm. so you see almost like these two forks in the road. Like you can go this way and it's, it's not going to be good. Or you can go this other way, which has got some twists and turns and jagged edges. Mm. Um, but that's where life is. And it's interesting that you describe it that way because it is that, that uh, fork in the roads. Mm. That's what crisis really means. It's a, it's a crux. It's coming to a cross, yeah. a deciding point. I know we get freaked out by crisis, but actually crises are, are not bad things. Crises are opportunities to, uh, to reevaluate, to reprioritize, mm -hmm. to ask yourself a question. What am I looking for? Mm -hmm. Christ question there. What are you seeking? Yeah, and that's just it. And that's actually something that I've even been reflecting on recently in my spiritual life, which is realizing that, you know, there are going to be various hardships and points where you're going to have to make some hard decisions, you know, hard and fast. Like uh, one, one that many young people kind of deal with is like um, getting married or not or joining the priesthood or not, you know. There is a very clear yes or no kind of happening there. And it can be a really difficult place of discernment. Um, sometimes when you're dating a girl and she's lovely, it's not so hard to say yes. So then you go up. But then walking up to the altar is another thing altogether. Um, but anyways, I kind of came to one of those little crossroads in yeah. my spiritual life. You were saying it was dealing with a bit of anxiety and some... Yeah, it was a combination of anxiety, specific problems that were kind of coming up in my mm. social sphere. Um, uh, just, it came down to really a question of, Nick, where are you going to find yourself in the world? Mm. Um, what is your vocation and, to, and, and your occupation, really? Those are important questions. Those are very important questions. We've been reflecting a lot on Pope Francis' uh, letter to young people, Christus Vivit. Yeah. Um, we've been reading that, I wouldn't say reading it together, but reading it together. Mm -hmm. Not, alone Not side by other, side, but, but office yeah, by office. Office yeah. by office. And, <laughs> and it's been interesting. <clears throat> it's been interesting for me to reflect on that letter, uh, given the, the years that I've worked with young people. And uh, I, I believe I have a youthful heart. So it speaks to me in that way. And I love the <laughs> distinction the Holy Father makes between young people and youth. Um, young people is a stage in life. Youth is a disposition of heart. So I mm -hmm. try to cling to that. Um, but it, one of the thoughts that's occurred to me is uh, uh, we've been working together for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've grown in great, great respect for you, uh, Nick, for the gifts that you have and the, the training you've been, you. the disposition part that you do have. Um, I realize as we're, as we're reading this document that this uh, kind of impinges on you in, in, in two very, very clear ways. One, as a young person yourself, so you're in the midst of, these, uh, uh, of this stage of life and the youthfulness of heart, and so this is affecting you very personally. But then also you're involved in mentoring and accompanying other young mm -hmm. people, which is such a great grace. And so there's this whole other level. Um, but one of the, th sorry, I'm kind of coming around to the question I have in my roundabout, <laughs> a, a little, a little wayward, wayward circle, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know. <laughs> um, uh, point being, though, I, like I'm he hearing as you're speaking about this crisis and, uh, you know, it was a vocational crisis. And that's not just vocation about state and life vocation. Yeah, it's this general sense of vocation, calling. You yeah. know? And the Holy Father speaks in his, uh, in his letter so beautifully about this restlessness mm. that I know, I remember as a young man, that restlessness, which can be um, a real pain in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> it can be. And, and it can also be a, a point of like, is there something wrong with me? Is there something wrong with this restlessness? Am I just want to get on? And yet we recognize that this is a God-given restlessness. And that's a good thing. I'm just wondering, Finally, get to my question. <laughs> How much of this crisis that you're experiencing and that sense of, you know, even anxiety and fear, would you recognize now in your experience may have been a manifestation of that restlessness, which <laughs> is really speaking often of a call? You know, it's really funny you just said that because that's been my question in my prayer time the last few days, um, mainly occasioned by the Christus Vivid document. Um, one thing that Pope Francis said outside of the Christus Vivid document, um, I think I came across that around the same time of this particular uh, point of decision, was he said, as evangelists, as Christians, we always have to remember where we've come from. Mm. Um, and what I, you know, like uh, at the time, that, kind of, that comment was kind of glossed over by a lot of people. But it really struck me hardcore because how often do we get into the faith? And how often do we just get, have these concerns that suddenly are foisted upon us? Um, all of these things that sometimes blot out our memory of what, of how we actually came to the faith. And then it's like, you know, this is not without consequence because um, 
if we are approaching, for example, a young person, as a young person, and as a young person, you've actually forgotten how you were first attracted to the gospel in a deeper mm. way. This is not going to be attractive anymore because you're no longer in touch with um, how Christ spoke to you. You know, the life of a disciple is always trying to discern how you're supposed to prove how you are to witness Christ to others, but also to remember how Christ has witnessed to you. So with this particular crisis, which I've been, you know, particularly vague on because there's a lot kind of in that, um, I had to come to a place where I realized Excuse me, but I'm sure that people aren't going to have to, you know, long stretch the imagination to be able to identify with a personal crisis. Yeah, yeah, one yeah. One would prefer not to get into the details. My of crisis whatever that is, is your own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, that's just fine. Mm -hmm. But um, what I kind of came to realize is that um, I had to get into, into a deeper prayer life. I was mm. doing prayer. I was doing some, like, rosaries, and I was doing some basic lecture divina. But I realized, like, I need to set aside, like, a holy hour. Mm. is what I decided. And what I first did with this holy hour is I sat down with this little book called The Love That Keeps Us Sane by... Great book. Oh my gosh. It's mm -hmm. a tiny little book, but there's just so much true and What's good. the author of that, Mark? Father Mark Foley. Father Mark Foley. Who's um, a Carmelite uh, priest. Mm -hmm. And I think he's also got some certification in psychology. Okay. Psychology and spirituality. It's a, it's a dynamic duo. Yeah. The Love That Keeps Us Sane. The Love That Keeps Us Sane. Recommend 10 out of 10. Um... And so I started working through I chapters. Thank you for introducing me to that book. Yeah, uh, yeah no, you left you're it on welcome. my desk one day, and I, yeah, it yeah. sat there for I think about two months before I finally picked with the up. other books. <laughs> and then read through the whole thing. So it was great. Yeah, yeah, so, no, it's a beautiful book. But one of the things that kind of happened in that book was I came to encounter Saint Therese mm -hmm. um, because that's what that book's about. Um, it's about like um, just coming to see Saint Therese's little way. Um, of being childlike before God as actually the grounds for not just good spirituality, um, which it is, mm. but also good psychology. Mm. And for me, I just encountered this holistic kind of approach in that book. And it's only like 100 pages long, mm. you know. Was but this when you were in university, just out of university? I was in my master's degree. You were, okay. Um, yeah, so I was married in my master's degree. I think Denise was pregnant with our little daughter, Rosé, at the time. So not too, too long ago then. Not terribly long ago. Um, I guess three years now yeah, okay. would probably be what it is. So, you know, three years and I'd been doing religious studies and theology for five years yeah. by that point. Yeah. So it was just like, you know, it was also humbling for me to realize I've been just studying and, you know, not studying in a kneeling manner, <laughs> you know, up until that point. It's kind of like on genuflecting on one knee from time to time. Sure. Funny, the Holy Father, uh, in a recent homily, was just speaking about that, the huge difference between, you know, knowing Jesus and knowing Jesus. You know, <laughs> is it the book learning, or have we actually encountered the Word of God? Uh, the difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. I guess, is really yeah, I, I, I often come with the analogy of a date. You know, whenever you're actually on a date with, uh, say, a girl or, or a guy, you know, if you're a young lady listening, um, you know, you can kind of go on Facebook and creep Facebook creep, all of these facts about the person, about, right? Mm. But if you go into the date basically being like, so you've done this, you've done this, you've done this, you've done this, great. Now I know you. So what, what do you know about me? Like last, that's the first and last date. <laughs> first and last, you know. And the last shall be first. Um, anyways, it's funny because uh, actually. Case, the first shall be last. <laughs> the first shall be last, yeah. You know, uh, this is eisegesis into our time yeah. period here. Um, anyways, but uh, yeah, no, like, I mean, what's going to happen is exactly, you're going to lose the person. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's a very relational question of, um, do you know Jesus? Mm -hmm. And there's also that scriptural passage is, uh, be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. How did Therese lead you into this then? Uh, what was the fruit from this, from that book that, that you gleaned? Well, the fruit was, um, you know, as a young man, um, as young men, there's a lot of energy that young men have. Um, there's a lot of uh, ambition. There's a lot of um, kind of this irascibility, this tendency to overcome obstacles that um, a young man could kind of tend to identify with. Mm -hmm. And a certain amount of this is appropriate because, you know, God gives us energy at a certain, at a young age to go and start learning and to tackle all these things to get a life set up, you know. But the main problem that a young man will have spiritually, in my experience, um, is being childlike before God mm -hmm. and not trying to accomplish it on their own steam. Um, and I was doing... Why do you think that's the biggest challenge? Or one of the big challenges? Because I would agree with you. you have ability. You have ability. And like this is a gift from God. 
Um, and you know, you can do a lot on your own ability, but the problem comes is eventually you encounter your weakness. Mm. And, and for a young man to admit weakness. Right? Oh, it's terrible, yeah. <laughs> you know. And so I've had more than enough times in my life where I've had to admit weakness, right? Um, so the problem came is that in the middle moment of crisis, um, you have a couple choices. You can ignore your weakness or you can, all, you can see it. And so I came to a place which by my temperament and personality, it's just normal to see my weakness. I see it all the time. Um, and that scared me. Mm. Um, that was a very frightening experience. Um, and it continues to be. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, it's, it's appropriately so in certain respects. So then um, St. Therese um, really kind of guided me out of that because with her notion of just abandonment to the Father, um, she had this such a trusting disposition to the Father in heaven who is good. And it really makes you overcome some of your negative father images of God mm -hmm. um, as is judge in the sky mm -hmm. or someone is about to strike you with a lightning bolt, this mm -hmm. Zeus image, you know? Yeah. Um, so that was one. Also just this recognition that, um, you know, my life is not going to be um, estimated by my products, you mm -hmm. know? It's actually about um, how, how much of myself I'm actually putting out there in terms of um, being receptive to the Lord in the middle of this. Mm -hmm. Am I willing to be led by him, led by a thread? Is a, is, a, is a term we use here at St. Therese. Yeah. So there was a bunch more happening there, but the childlikeness hmm. and the abdication of self-reliance was hmm. a big one. So being able to square with your own weakness, which is an unavoidable fact, you know, yeah. you mask it over, hide it, but a squaring with your weakness and then coming to encounter the Father in his mercy, mm -hmm. not, as, not as judge, uh, not as somebody you need to prove yourself to. That's what I hear you saying then. Yeah, and Beautiful. I mean, and God is judge in one way or another. Um, that's a term that requires a little bit of unpacking. But he, in the Gospels in particular, the New Testament revelation shows a Jesus who says, let the little ones come to me, mm -hmm. you know. and The judge who is mercy. The judge who is mercy, you know. Yeah. We have this tendency to kind of subjugate God's mercy or his justice to one another, yeah. you know. Basically, say define his mercy by his justice, or define his justice by his mercy. When in fact, I love um, Chesterton's kind of analogy of like these are two burning brands close together, mm. and so um, you know. But his mercy is precisely the reason for the incarnation, for yeah. Jesus Christ coming. And if we don't have that fact, I'm very convinced we're going to have a very real problem with Catholicism, and mm -hmm. we're going to find it difficult and leave it untried. I think that's why we have <laughs> a current crisis in the church. Yeah, it's yeah. Just this very reason. I, one of the uh, one of my favorite aspects of Saint Therese and the Little Way uh, is exa exactly uh, that notion when Saint Therese's beautiful heart just moves with uh, with um, resolve and uh, you almost have this sense of uh, she's stating the the most obvious fact mm -hmm. uh, about God that. Yeah. His justice is mercy. You know, these two firebrands you speak of, but his justice is mer mercy because in order for his justice to be just, he has to take into account mm -hmm. our, our condition of, of ongoing weakness and limitation. Yeah. He knows we're weak. He knows I'm weak. He knows you're weak, and he factors that in and how important that is. Yeah, and, and St. Therese brought me to a point in my prayer life where it was just like, um, I realized that if St. Paul says we are to pray always, number one, that means it must be possible. Because mm -hmm. if God is putting that ask upon us, then it needs to be possible in some manner. And then the next thing that kind of came to my mind was, um, I can't do that. So wait, that means God's got to help. Um, and so then I realized the only way to do that by, is by doing exactly as St. Therese did, um, throwing myself into the Father's arms. Um, there's a few other different uh, ways of kind of depicting that same movement in all the various spiritualities of the church. It's a universal movement, though. Mm -hmm. um, so how that brought me to St. Therese Institute is um, I had a special spot in my heart for St. Therese from that point forward, and it was imperfect. I didn't fully understand her just yet, but mm -hmm. I knew something was there. So then I saw, you know, uh, Denise and I, with uh, the arrival of our little one, um, we decided to move to Saskatchewan because it would be closer to her family, and I, I love her family dearly. Um, but I also saw there was a few more opportunities for kind of learning and teaching in Saskatchewan because I'd had, I'd had formation for seven and a half years, you know, 
in uh, theology and philosophy and all these kinds of stuff. And I was feeling at this point that I had been filled up like a larder, but then if I didn't start taking stuff out of the larder, everything, something was going to start rotting, yeah. you know, <laughs> like um, there was going to be yeah. some mold set in and all that kind of stuff. And so then I started applying to various things. And one of the job positions that was available was St. Therese Institute. Mm -hmm. And so I even, uh, I even recommended, I mean, and kind of the rest is history, but um, I even mentioned in the application letter that there's a certain um, uh, sanguinity I felt with St. Therese and I felt that there was something kind of pulling me and tugging me. Interesting. And uh, I did feel that. Yeah. Um, so you had not actually, um, like you, you encountered St. Therese the saint before you'd encountered St. Therese St. Therese the institution. Yep. So a beautiful preparation. But this was not the first time that you'd heard about St. Therese Institute, is it? <laughs> no, and God's that goes funny a little like bit that. Further back, eh? Yeah, yeah. Back when I was in high school, um, there was a student who actually became an instructor here, and I actually took over some of his courses. Yeah, uh, that's funny in itself. But um, a student named Chris O'Hara, yeah. who um, was from Halifax, Nova mm -hmm. Scotia, and I and went back there. Now he works. He works the there for the archdiocese. Yeah, fine fellow he is. Yeah, yeah. He's a uh, very, very bold, very personal mm -hmm. uh, individual. I quite like him. Um, but he did a retreat, a week-long retreat before a Steubenville Atlantic conference. Mm -hmm. Those are excellent to check out. Um, and he was the retreat leader, so I got to know him then, and he had just come off of a year of St. Therese. Mm -hmm. Now, if you told him that he was going to go back to St. Therese and teach for like four or five years and help out here, and that I was actually going to go take over his classes, we would have both died. Like, it just would not have happened. So I knew about St. Therese around the time of its founding, two, two years after it kind of was founded. But let's come back, died why? Of shock, of laughter, of fear? Uh, all of the above. All of the above. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, these <laughs> mixtures of emotions. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's funny how the Lord kind of works like that. Um, and, uh, you know, I find that more and more whenever I look at my life, I have to kind of pay attention to these weird little residences and mm. coincidences, you know. Um, and often just pondering those kind of leads to more. Maybe come back to the original question I asked, you know, that, that, uh, the question of what were you seeking? Now, I know in my own experience, it's often, uh, as they say, the 2020 hindsight. Mm -hmm. You look over your shoulder and maybe realize that there were things you're looking for that you weren't able to articulate at the time. So mm -hmm. what brought you to St. Therese Institute? <clears throat> you know, a wife that was from the, from the, the province, mm -hmm. uh, the need for a job, the need to start sharing what you'd learned. Those are all natural things. In retrospect, though, as you look back over the last two years, um, what were you seeking? And maybe another way of describing that is, what did you discover here? What are the graces? <laughs> well, if I fetch out my journal, I'm just, yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Um, top of your head, top of your top heart. Top of my head, top of my heart. Um, well, to tell you the truth, um, what, it might be good to reflect on why I'm staying at St. Therese. Hmm. Um, because there's one thing that's happening here at St. Therese Institute that I think is absolutely great, which is, um, and you and I have already talked about this, an incarnational approach to things. Yes. I, the word becoming flesh. The word becoming flesh. Yeah. And if you reflect on the word as being fully human, fully divine, and all aspects of life. Maybe before you move on, just that, that clarity of what do you mean by an incarnational approach? Because that's mm. a word we'll toss out there, and I know yep. it, you know it, but what do you mean by that? Well, I think that when you look at the incarnation, um, you see, you have to reflect on Jesus as the whole, not just as God, not just as man, but as both, and not just a part of both, but fully God, fully man. The, the, like, it's actually amazing, like Catholicism is unique for this, to have a central figure um, who is the complete sphere of the divine and the complete sphere of the human in one. So what does that mean? It's the whole, you know, it's the whole of the cosmos and the whole of, of uh, divinity in one thing. Now, when you start reflecting on that and breaking it down, it has dramatic consequences for human life because no longer are we supposed to be myopic or nearsighted or farsighted. Um, we have to take into account the whole picture. Um, and every day that we pray, it means that we can actually be fully human in the course of our day and fully in union with God. You know, uh, many religions and many uh, even takes on Christianity have put these things in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. And so when I come to St. Therese and I see um, what we're doing here, yes, there's the cross, 
but there's also the resurrection around the corner. And I just see St. Therese Institute as um, embracing that childlike disposition before God and recognizing that in giving ourselves to God, our humanity is fulfilled, and then in actually fostering healing in our humanity, our, our, um, our pursuit of God is fulfilled. So for me, it's incredibly life-giving to find a focus that is just so crystal clear on trying to promote the authentically human and the authentically mystical mm. at the same time. Um, that all is very, still very uh, abstract. It's not very like, oh, I like this thing about the program, I like this thing. But in general, I think that's what the program does. Um, so how do you see, and maybe we can get practical, but this notion of the incarnational, which the way I would describe it, the incarnational in a very tangible way is, um, it's about, it's about uh, integration. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the integration yep. of faith and life. It's the recognition that my encounter with Christ is transformative and translates itself into every aspect of my, of my being. Yep. In other words, uh, as I used to protest when I was in my, in my theology classes is, what we're learning here is not going to do anybody uh, uh, any, any, earth, good. any earthly good unless it walks, talks, and lives, and breathes in the yep. everyday. And that's the transformative encounter with Christ that now walks, talks, lives, and breathes in what I do. That's how I would very tangibly describe that. Yeah, that's and, what I mean by word being And what flesh. you're doing is just literally kind of picking up where I left off. Yeah. Like for me, I'm very metaphysical in terms of I get into like the... These, and the metaphysical concepts to me, they're not um, impersonal. To me, like, they're very deeply relevant. Because if Christ's divinity was against his humanity, like, what does that mean for human life? It means we're constantly trying to lop off a, a section of our humanity. Mm. You know? Disintegration. Disintegration. Yeah. Um, but it's true. If you actually think of Jesus Christ as a principle, then it's, that's, you've got an ideology. Yeah. If you think of us as, as a person, then going exactly into what you said, this is transformative. So what are some of these practical ways that you see this yourself mm -hmm. lived out in the context of St. Therese Institute in the formation program yeah. or work with the students, the students' <sighs> lives? Well, it's, it's really cool because um, when you actually look at St. Therese Institute, yes, we're a school. We teach academia um, in some form. You know, we're not creating ac academics. We're trying to form intentional disciples. But we have an incredible focus on community, which is a microcosm of the body of Christ. Um, we have share groups for that, high-low sessions. We have um, all of these integrative exercises um, that are not just cold and abstract, but they actually are trying, uh, we actually are tracking the pulse of the Holy Spirit moving in the middle of it. Um, this is lived experience on top of um, theoretical or speculative or intellectual. Let's say that. That's a better word for it. Mm. Um, so we're, I see this constant play in the program of the will and the intellect residing in the heart. Mm. And this just constant go back and forth. And for sure, when I'm bringing my gifts to, the, to here, I, I'm definitely working a lot on that intellectual sphere. But, I mean, I'm not heartless. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I see that direct relevance. Um, I also see it just, um, I just, I just see it. As in the course of the year, as the students go on, some of the students in the beginning have trepidations. Um, some of them have hardnesses of heart or wounds or, you know, their own conceptions of how things are supposed to go. But in general, across everyone, I see like this, this mellowing, hmm. you know, that kind of happens. And this mellowing is not getting lazy. It's actually becoming docile mm -hmm. and humble and joyful, you know. Maybe returning to language we were speaking of before, what I recognize is the encounter with God where God speaks his stillness into that, that be still and know that I am God. Well, what a beautiful thing when that uh, youthful restlessness is actually able to come and rest in God, not at the expense of the restlessness, but as a purification of it because that energy and that drive now becomes, I see, more focused. So, yep. interesting. So, uh, I'd asked, what were you looking for? What were you seeking? <laughs> and in retrospect, what you're seeking, you said, well, what's keeping me here? And the first thing you're saying is, this incarnational approach, yeah. which clearly from the length of time we've spoken about it, is of significant importance to... Oh, it's the central principle. Yeah. yeah. What other things? You know, kind of just maybe three or four things, boom, boom, boom. What's keeping you here? Which is an interesting way of putting it, Nick, because the, you know, right after Jesus says to those disciples coming from John at the beginning of the gospel, what are you seeking? Hmm. Their response is, where are you staying? <laughs> so it's interesting you're saying, is what, what's, why am I staying? So that actually, mm -hmm. speaking kinda, about that disciple's response, I've encountered Christ, I want to stay here. So. 
Yeah, no, I, I think that it, it's all connected. Um, I'd say that kind of looking at it is what kind of attracted me here was the promise of integration. Now, I, at the same time, I didn't really know the program all that well, but I knew if St. Therese was in the center, I could work with this. Because hmm. um, for me, St. Therese is just an incredibly weak individual who just heroically in her own way gave to God, you know, um, herself. That's the best gift she could have given. So when I look at, when I'm here at St. Therese, and I mean, obviously the student community forms their own community, but it's just such a pleasure to be able to step into a classroom um, and teach, knowing that what I'm gonna teach is not just some kind of um, speculative inquiry, but it's something that the students are taking to heart and are gonna be looking to apply. The amount of times that actually I teach a history class and all of a sudden, I see what we were talking about in the history class, some of the movements of the Holy Spirit in the church come and have an impact on the community and like these students kind of in, in, integrating it in their own way. Um, it's uncanny. Um, and so for me, that turns around and actually challenges me. Um, and for me, that's a good challenge. Um, now, could that help in other places? Sure, Catholicism is a big world. Um, but in particular, there is just this resonance um, happening here in Bruno um, at St. Therese Institute. And it's good. I see it as good for me. And I see there's a very real opportunity for giving of myself. Um, and yeah, I found that this, the fruits have been um, a deeper encounter with Christ and mm. becoming more childlike as the time goes on. Again, I feel like you're looking for a specific answer. Um, but uh, I'm not sure. Like it's, I think that's mm. generally this journey. And yeah. I could point to specific instances, but that's generally what it is. And I think St. Therese Institute is a remarkable opportunity for that. Not the only opportunity, of course. As I said, Catholicism is a big world. But um, it, is a, it is a very good instantiation. You, you stand in a very, as I mentioned before, it's a very interesting point of view of, of uh, being a, a mentor and an accompanier in the role that you have because of your, uh, your possession, your education, your experience. But you yourself are also right in the middle of the demographic that we are seeking <laughs> to serve and how beautiful that is. Yep. And very early in, uh, in some of the resolve to some of those vocational crises, you're at that crossroads, and, and uh, that's beautiful. So maybe as we, as we uh, uh, begin to wind up our conversation here, uh, one last question I would ask you, Nick, mm -hmm. uh, before I ask you another question, which inevitably will happen. <laughs> um, uh, but just from your perspective as a young person yourself, what do you see as the value and again, you're speaking from both of these as a young person, but also as a, as a mentor and, and invested in this work. What do you see as the value of what is being offered at St. Therese Institute in the encounter with St. Therese the Saint, which leads mm -hmm. to the encounter with Jesus Christ uh, at this time? In, in this time of the church. At this time in the church. Yeah. Yes, now, hmm. as a Canadian young person yourself, mm -hmm. why is this significant? What's the importance of this? I think that St. Therese is a remarkable opportunity for a world that is becoming increasingly unstable. Um, you know, even 10 years ago, I think in the Canadian context, there was a little more certainty about society and, you know, like kind of where things were going in the church, outside of the church, politically, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think in the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of fragmentation and polarization happen. Mm. So that's a very real problem. And the thing is, is that youth, um, whether we like it or not, um, we all want some kind of security. Um, the problem in yeah, this time- I don't time, think that's exclusive to young people. No, I, well, it's a human thing, but <laughs> yeah, there's a particular yeah. desire sure. for structure and desire for security. Mm -hmm. Even people who want to go like, you know, traveling and just like backpack across Europe with no plan, um, there is still a form of security that they're finding that in identity, you know. And what happens in this time of polarization um, is this need for security and identity becomes all the more accentuated. Hmm. Um, and there's a reason I think that we're seeing this youthful generation being one of the most cynical um, hmm. in the middle of this too. Because uh, disenchantment, all the identities are kind of falling to the side. You know, so for students that are coming to St. Therese Institute, what they're getting is the rock bottom foundation. Um, if you can actually embrace St. Therese's core teaching of abandonment to God, 
and recognize that God is a, is a loving Father, and that is the core revelation that Jesus Christ is putting forward, and the Holy Spirit is our energy, and Christ is our brother and our model, you know, if you can accept, accept that, then no matter what walk of life you're going to walk into from this point forward into the Canadian context, the American context, the world context, no matter the, the rough seas, there's going to be a calm in the storm. Mm. Um, so I think that's the remarkable opportunity. Of course, this all depends on how much you give. Um, you know, one of the things we say in the program is uh, you can get as much out of this program as you're willing to give. Yeah. You know, how deep can you go? How deep do you want to go? go? Yeah. Um, I've talked to a few students, and I'm not just saying this as a biased instructor, although I'm certainly um, have a bit of bias, you know, I think what I'm teaching is right. Um, I'm kidding around. the biggest reason come St. Therese? I'm right. Next. <laughs> <laughs> I must be. I will be. Um, but like I've talked to a few students who even entered the program with a bit of skepticism. Sure. And they just walk out and they're like, this is a universally helpful experience. There's mm. no reason not to consider it. Um, mm. And I think it's not primarily because of even the way we do it, but because of the truth that we're trying to communicate in our little way, our loaves and fishes, mm. you know. Um, if you get to know St. Therese, it's, this is a very good starting ground for anything else. That's maybe the one thing I would kind of say, and there's lots more, of course, but mm. yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, uh, one other question. I told you, I mentioned that questions are going to spawn questions, but we always have a movie section on this one. So... You've been discussing, as we're going to move into our movie, you've been discussing some of these key things. And, and uh, I know we discussed earlier what we might do with the movie, but I have a different one for you. Um, one of the key themes that seems to be coming up from your sharing is that encounter and invitation to abandonment and surrender. Mm. Uh, so I'm going to totally put you on the spot here, Nick. <laughs> You're doing triple duty on this. It's tying into our previous conversation. It's looking after the movies and getting into the, a question for Nick. Jim, you sound a bit too much like Christ. You ask too much. <laughs> yeah, I ask too much. Yeah. Um, so the question I have for you, Nick, is uh, uh, what what movie comes to mind and heart hmm. that would embody this theme of abandonment oh, gosh. and surrender? I saw that, that question coming and I started panicking. Um, <laughs> I know, I'm totally putting you on the spot. Yeah, curious. yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's many. Um, like we talked about Rudy. A little while ago, yeah. um, which I think is a perfect depiction of the young heart and mm. this question of abandonment. Um, I would say that, um, but put that aside for now because we've already talked about it a bit. But there's a particular point in the movie where Rudy has to abandon, and then he gets his dream. You know, he works, he prepares himself, he's actively receptive, but then he has to just let God be God. Mm -hmm. You know, and realize that he's not. So that's a beautiful instance in that film. I think the Lord of the Rings have quite an element of this as well, mm. you know? There's this constant um, letting go of, you know, because the ring represents what each person wants in certain respects and of the concupiscence, you know, of our disordered desire. But it's funny because Aragorn at one time in that movie, in the extended edition, has the opportunity to, to grab the ring from Frodo. And you can tell he's compelled because he, you know what he would do is almost like what Gandalf would do which is like, I would use this ring to do much good, but mm. then an evil power inside me mm. will just destroy everything. It's chaos. Mm. Um, and then Aragorn closes Frodo's hand and says, this is yours to bear. Yeah. You know, so it's this abandonment. And he doesn't know where the future's gonna go. He's gonna be the king of Gondor and he's struggling with that vocation. Um, it's a beautiful thing. You're, you're absolutely right. Just tying in with something you mentioned earlier, but the, the um you know, the ring very really invites from each person the weakness from them that they believe is strength, mm. but it's their weakness. Um, and so for, for Aragorn to do that, where he uh, is really surrendering it to Frodo, who if we look at it with a sacramental understanding, Frodo very much is the suffering servant. Mm -hmm. He is a Christ figure Yep. Uh, in the surrendering. It's calling to mind as you're speaking, it's calling to mind that very poignant scene of Boromir. Oh, yeah, who I was just thinking fall, that, yeah. Who does give in, who does betray, you know, and he's so human. Like, I identify with Boromir. Oh, 100%. I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. And, and yet, his heroism, no greater love. Mm -hmm. 
and to lay down oh, one's life. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, you can look at Boromir and you can see, like, you could, between Aragorn and Boromir, I think we've all been those two at particular points in our life. Mm. We would like to be Aragorn all the time, but what of Boromir when we are Boromir? And you know what? He's, um, his, uh, his giving into the ring at one point and trying to harass Frodo for it. Well, what happens? He repents. He turns around and defends the hobbits, you know, and he, he's on his dying breaths and he's, um, he confesses, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know. And, and, and it's a confession of faith, isn't it? It is a confession of faith. Again, because with the sacramental understanding, we recognize while Frodo is the, the priest, mm -hmm. Gandalf the prophet, <laughs> Aragorn the king. The king. And yeah. so Boromir dies with the words on his lips of... I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I can't sorry. think of the same words. Yeah, you no, know, it's, like... just, it's I'm sorry, but then he's also like my, my, you know, my king. Yeah. My king. He's claiming exactly. what he's been fighting against all along. And, and he's a good king. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, there's, uh, there's a few other movies I could probably recommend, but I think that those are kind of two things right off the top of my head. Yeah. So... I guess we're now getting to the part of the show where we ask each other a question. So, Jim, I'm going to start. That's fine. And I'm not going to ask you questions because I've been peppering you questions. I'm going to forego that. I'll give you an opportunity. This has kind of okay. turned into the Jim pursuing Nick show. Um, <laughs> anyways, a little waywards as usual. Um, so kind of along the themes of, uh, you know, um, what we've been talking about this podcast, the question of really it's been a mishmash of various themes like calling. It's been a question of, discernment it's been a question of um weakness um could you kind of maybe share for us like um like how you've related to saint therese in your weakness a bit um like how has saint therese kind of um impacted you as you kind of deal with various crises in your life um yeah um probably i would just lean atop my head maybe it's because it was just mentioned so recently but i would uh, i would just come back to what i'd mentioned before uh, St. Therese's um, audacious claim and absolute conviction that God's justice is merciful. Mm. Because in order for God to be acting justly and true to himself, in his, in his love, he has to take into consideration our weakness. And so uh, there's a, a solicitousness, uh, just an, an openness. Um, and that God's mercy is is limitless, unbounded. Um, the only thing that limits God's mercy is my unwillingness to receive it. Hmm. And uh, for me, I think that is probably the greatest remedy to my, uh, to my weakness of pride. Hmm. Uh, which we all have. Which, which yes, yeah, the human condition. But uh, in any circumstance that I face in life, when I, when I feel helpless, hopeless, uh, foiled, uh, and it's usually when I look at it clearly, <clears throat> as you say, without myopia, the nearsightedness, without the fire, when I look at it clear-sighted in the light of Christ, I realize it's my own pride, my mm -hmm. lack of humility, my fear of God, my fear of myself, my fear of being judged by others, my fear of not being accepted, my fear of not belonging. Um, and fear the of failure. Fear of failure. And it's the mercy of God that is the remedy for all of that. Um, you know, St. Therese teaches us that the, the little way is not about doing little things. It's about being little. Mm -hmm. And the more in contact I am with my weakness and, and willing to admit that and to come to God and, and say that. Um, my dad, I was chatting with him over the summer, and he shares, uh, he shares a story about a priest friend of his that, uh, that described his relationship with God in this way. Hmm. And I thought it was really beautiful. He just describes it as, look at me, Jesus. Look at me. Look what I'm doing now. I'm screwing up again. <laughs> and I think if I had that disposition of heart of littleness of just look at me, Jesus, I've messed up, but I'm willing to push myself off the ground by your grace and recommit. And I can't do it. Mm -hmm. But with you, we can. So Therese's understanding and, and incarnation of God's mercy and mm -hmm. reception of it. Yeah, that's, that's key. Yeah, no, I, I really like that, Jim. That was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, last I guess word. now it's time for the last word. So All right. a little bit of rock, paper, rock, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. Oh, we did it again. Rock, paper, scissors. There <laughs> okay, we go. Okay, I got it's it. Yours. There we go. About time. <laughs> I think I did it last time too. <laughs> 
Well, thanks to everyone who is tuning in, uh, tuning in with us for this podcast. If you liked what you heard, please let us know um, as we continue forward with this podcast. Um, little interjection for a shout out to Zach Lunghammer. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, the cups on this show were made for us by L Zach Lunghammer. On mine, it says, yes, I talk with my hands. Apparently, I, am, I talk with my hands quite Let's a see bit. see it. Oh, yeah, right there. No, see? no. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Oh, this. <laughs> oh, there, that's. And what does yours say, Jim? Uh, what's stirring? Uh, one of my favorite questions. What's stirring? Uh, not so much what's stirring in the cup, but what's stirring in the heart. <laughs> yeah. But coffee's Jim, always close to my heart. For any, any students at St. Therese, the, people know that there's a bunch of Jimisms that uh, just wheel their way into your head and into your mind and your soul. And sometimes you resent them, and sometimes they're awesome. I'm kidding around. I'm not irritating you? No. I'm sanctifying you. No, sure. <laughs> All right, last word. Okay, now is the last word. But once again, thank you to everyone who's tuning in for this podcast. If you liked what you heard, please let us know um, in the comments on Facebook, giving us an email. It greatly helps us kind of move forward with this thing, um, whether that's short term or long term. Um, yeah, just regarding the themes of this podcast, um, just if you were feeling challenged in the middle of this, if you were listening, um, that, you know, rather grappling with the question of I'm not weak or I, I am really weak, how can this possibly be? something that I can actually turn into something good. Um, maybe just uh, ask, uh, ask God and ask St. Therese to kind of come into your life a little bit and just teach you something there. At the sum bottom of it all, we are creatures before God's marvelous plan. And um, that would be a good end note to kind of leave with and one that I need to take to prayer as well. So thank you very much. Until next time, this has been Nick and Jim on A Little Waywards. <laughs>